this. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Alaska Book Week. There's a whole lot of events coming up this week. And in fact, they're, they've all been posted. So you could go to alaskabookweek.org and find out about all the great literary events going on. Um, tonight, uh, I'm Martha Amore, a uh, local Anchorage writer and professor. And tonight I'm interviewing Lucian Childs. Um, Lucian is a fiction writer whose debut work, Dreaming Home, 2023, was published to critical acclaim by Biblioasis. He was a Rasmussen Foundation Individual Artist Project Grant Awardee, a Peter, Peter Taylor Fellow at the Kenyon Review Writers Workshop, and an artist in residence at Birdcliff Art Colony and Artscape Gibraltar Point. He was a contributing editor of Lambda Literary Finalist, Building Fires in the Snow, a collection of Alaska LGBTQ short fiction and poetry. His stories and reviews have appeared in the literary journals Grain, The Puritan, Cirque, Prairie, and Prairie Fire, among others. A 25-year resident of Anchorage, he now lives in Toronto, Ontario. For more information, please visit www.lucianchilds.com. And hey. I'm really looking forward to uh, speaking with Lucian because um, we we are old time friends. In fact, we both were editors of the Building Fires in the Snow and we had a lot of fun with that project. Uh, so my first question for you, Lucian, well, I just want to say, uh, I, before we start, I just want to say how, how great it is to uh, be talking with you again. Uh, some people may know, they may have read that blog post that I did for the 49 writers, but we met in 2010 uh, at the, at, so that's like 13 years ago at the Catch Mike Bay Writers Conference. And we were so excited. I still remember exactly where we were. We were so excited, practically jumping up and down that, uh, that we were both short story writers. And uh, you know, we formed a, a literary friendship that's now 13 years old. And uh, so it feels um, you know, really good to be uh, talking again to you about writing. In this case, finally, I have a book to talk about. But we're mostly talking tonight about um, starting a literary career as, a, as an older person. Yeah, so uh, that's a great segue into my first question. How does it feel to have your first book out there at the age of 74? And you don't look <laughs> it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, it's like obviously it's like uh, a lot of feelings, mostly all amazing. Um, uh, because I've been working mostly in obscurity for almost twenty years now. I mean, I started out uh, in Anchorage, just you know, taking my little short stories to this uh, uh, critique group that met at Borders Books. I didn't know anything. Uh, and I really pushed myself over the course of these uh, 20 years to just get better and better and better to the point where I could, uh, you know, finally start, uh, you know, taking my work to the gatekeepers that are out there to, you know, get, get published. So, you know, I just kind of like, a, I feel like I'm kind of a, I, I definitely am an outlier. I mean, there are not very many people who start a, a literary career at this, at, at, at my age. If you look at the people that are out there, I was just looking, looking at the Texas uh, Book Festival um, uh, faculty, and they're just, they're all look to be in their 30s and in and, and 20s, and is kind of a young person's game. But I don't think that it needs to be. And I think that those of us who are older out there should not cede the ground, you know, to uh, to people who are uh, younger than us. Um, um, so you often hear, you know, I see tweeted all the time that, you know, people that are 40 years and older, it's too late to start a, a, a literary career in. Um, and I would say that that might be true 
if you're looking to sort of like a make a big splash, you want to get a, um, a an agent, you want to be published by a big house. You know, those those guys are really looking for a long term relationship and a and a big payday. Um, so they're going to want a multi book contracts and um, you don't want to help you have a long and lengthy uh, literary career. But if you did what Martha and I did uh, uh, for the the LGBTQ uh, Alaskan anthology, we went to an academic press, the uh, University of Alaska Press. So uh, uh, academic presses and small presses are are not as focused on on uh, um, the on the profit motive, and uh, they're more interested in it's more of a pure play. They're more interested in uh, uh, nurturing uh, their artists uh, and. Um, I was published by. Um, I guess you'd probably say it's the it's the uh, top small press in uh, in Canada. It'd be like I don't know, um, um, a City Lights or a Tin House or, or something like that. Um, um, uh, they do about 30 books a year, which is not a huge number, but it's a pretty substantial number. And they have a, a, a very strong reputation internationally. Their books have been nominated for the Mad Booker and places like that. And uh, so I'm just so like grateful, you know, that, um, that I was able to, uh, you know, hook up with the small press. And I think that's possible for people uh, out there. And we can talk, we're going to talk about other options uh, a little bit later, but definitely the small and academic presses are, are places where people um, who maybe not have, you know, a, a long career ahead of them or don't have a super commercial project uh, would want to uh, pursue. So just in terms of how I feel, it's like, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> amazing. Um, I mean, this book has gotten uh, a lot of positive press and, uh, um, you know, including, a, I mean, I woke up one morning and, and um, I kind of was looking and picked up my phone right away, which I try not to do, but I did. And this notification came down from the top of the screen and it had my name next to the words, New York times. <laughs> and I, uh, I went, what? <laughs> and I clicked on it and it went over to a, you know, an Instagram post where, uh, uh, and sure enough, you know, I would gotten a New York times review. So, I mean, that was like probably one of the best days of my life. <laughs> and, um, so it's super exciting. I don't, I guess it's kind of like when people retire and they start a new career, you know, they're really excited to be doing something maybe that they had put on hold you know, for when they got into their working lives and having families and stuff. And, and, you know, I started out as an English major and very, you know, pretty much I survived my childhood by reading and, and, uh, but I kind of put it aside, you know, it's like not something, I mean, and luckily, you know, you didn't and people like Don Reardon and so many people, I'm really jealous. They really stayed true to that early desire of theirs and went on to pursue English as a career, you know, and uh, I, I didn't, you know, I, I was an architect, a graphic designer, I did, you know, many things and, uh, but uh, it's, it feels really great to, you know, feel like I'm kind of at the beginning of something, even though I'm 74, you know, and I'm, uh, I'm super psyched to be moderating a panel that I put together at AWP in, in February. Uh, some really, really great writers doing the same at Saints and Sinners in New Orleans that Martha and I went to, to when we were promoting uh, Building Fires of the Snow. That was and, a lot um, of fun, by the way. <laughs> It yeah, was so much fun, and I'm going to be doing it with a. Uh, one of the things that's been so cool is is enlarging my literary friendships. And you know, for for so long I lived in uh, Alaska, and I mean, the Alaska literary scene is, you guys, it's um, are so blessed. It is, it is 
so amazing what's going on there through the Alaska Center for the Book and on 49 Writers and Alaska Writers Alaska Guild, Writers which, Guild. And I know that you're now a board member of and uh, it is off the hook in Alaska and I, I miss it so much you know I, there I mean there are writing organizations up here but it there's there's nothing to compare to what I I found in Alaska, but the the really cool thing is you know getting to the point where you know I'm a little bit more known generally, and I made literary friendships through of all places Twitter, which has been like amazingly collegial, and so um, like a bunch of the people are going to be in this panel on AWP. Uh, I made. Uh, uh, connected with through through Twitter, the fellow I'm going to be partnering with in uh, New Orleans. I met through Twitter, and he's from New Orleans, so I've told him that he needs to show me the real uh, New Orleans while we're up there. So I'm I, I'm very excited to uh, um, to feel like I'm you know I'm at the beginning of something. You know I'm not winding down uh, in my golden years. Uh, I'm uh, I'm winding up. So uh, that's a great um, way to put it. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We've got an, um, lot, I have a lot of questions here. What strategies have you found from your own experience that might be useful for older writers? Well, some of the things, you know, I talked about in some uh, uh, earlier 49 Writers po uh, podcasts, is some of the things are, are you know, not just specific to older writers, but that, I mean, we're writers, right? So, I mean, we have to do what every writer has to do. Has to do. And I, I'd say the, the first thing that we have to do is read. And uh, this is Alaska Book Week, after all, and it's all about reading and, uh, um, and books. And so I would say I would counsel you to whatever your chosen form would be. I mean, I'm a short story writer. And curiously, now a novelist, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, but if you're, an, I knew many people in in Anchorage who are essayists or memoirists or who, who wrote about nature, wrote about setting. Um, um, so whatever your chosen form, I think you just really have to drill down into it. And uh, you, I mean, myself, I'm a short story writer, so. Uh, and some of that was kind of by necessity because I was I had a really um, uh, demanding uh, workload. I was a graphic uh, a graphic designer, a freelance graphic designer when I lived in Anchorage, and and uh, I didn't have like a a lot of time. So I just you know instinctively thought this short form would be more manageable for me, and. Um, also had kind of some idea in my head, you know, that th that's what you did before you did the longer form. And, um, and I, I was heartened by Alice Monroe because she, she said the same thing when uh, in a Paris review uh, interview where she said she gravitated to the short form because it was something that she could do while her kids were napping. And, and but after she just kept writing them and after a long time that's how she thought about story and then so she abandoned uh her um goal to write a novel and so i did kind of this weird thing that i um i never really had a goal to write a novel um but uh my editors here in canada um I encourage me to link my stories to to the degree that it feels like a novel. So I, I get the best of both worlds. I can still be a short story writer, but uh, uh, the thing that I've written feels novelistic. Um, so anyway, read. I mean, read. You know what your what it is that you want to write, and I think that's pretty obvious. And I think probably everybody's already doing that. You know, I mean. I mean, when we read, I think writing is kind of an act of, I wouldn't say copying, but it's, you know, you read something, you get so touched by it, so psyched by it, you just go like, I want to do that, you know, I, I, let me see if I can do that, you know, and, and so um, I think everybody's probably already had that, you know, that, that, that experience, and they're all, probably already reading, but, you know, you're already reading, but you know, read more because there's there's 
you know, there's, you know, it's so um, amazing to, again to feel like you're part of this something bigger. You know, you're part of like for me now, I'm really part of the Canadian literary scene. You know, and so I, you know, I, what's being released? You know, what's coming out? You know, uh, what short story short, short story collections are coming out? Um, you know, and also queer literature too. You know, so it really kind of you know, if you feel like you need to be plugged in, I think um, it's not like you're writing to trends or anything like that. But I, everything you read is going to spark you and it's going to going to give you ideas and just, you know, give you energy. And so that's one thing I would say is read. Um, the other thing I it's that it's really the problem of time for us older writers, right? You know, because um, Malcolm Glad Gladwell famously has uh, um, uh, popularized the notion of the 10,000 hour rule, that if you're going to, uh, uh, that it takes a certain amount of innate talent uh, to, to do whatever it is you want to do, in our case, to, to write, um, but many people have innate talent. I would probably say most of us have innate talent. Um, I mean, you've been teaching writing for a long time, and I, I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, I, I don't think it's necessary some kind of like gift from heaven. I think it's something that storytelling is not really ingrained in us as human beings, I think, uh, genetically. But uh, what he's saying is, in addition to that, you have to have uh, this high level of preparation, uh, of, of praxis, people call it in the academic world. And um, well, I don't know if 10,000 hours is the right number, but uh, um, it's a lot. I mean, you have to do this a lot and often. I mean, how do you feel about that? Yeah, and I had heard that Gladwell thing. Although I also heard the ten thousand is more for like Michael Jordan playing basketball, <laughs> you know, <It's> like <laughs> getting like super duper pro. Um, <laughs> that is a lot of hours. But when you sit there and think of how drafting, you know how long. Well, I know it takes me, and and I know it also takes you because we're friends to get yeah. a story to where you feel like you can even share it it's a lot of hours that go into like 12 pages, you know, and, and, and days and months and years. So I, I agree. I just recently uh, published one that uh, I worked on for eight years. It got 104 rejections. Now I didn't work on it for eight years solid, you know, but uh, um, I'd work on it for a while and, you know, then it, uh, it then it get rejected and I'd set it aside for a while and I'd work on it some more and submit it again and get rejected. So, uh, but yeah, it just takes a super long time to, uh, I mean, if, if you want to, you know, write at a, you know, a high level, I think it just, you know, takes a, uh, it takes 10,000 hours. So as an older person, I would I would just say you really need to start as soon as you can. I mean, I started uh I was almost 60 when I started. So, I'm 74 now. So, I mean, you know, do the math. It's taken me 14 15 years uh to get to the point where I can uh, I I came out with this book, you know, where I, where my work is, you know, at the at, at a high enough level that I can, you know, send it out to you know, really good presses. Um, uh, so it just, yeah, it just uh, takes a long time. So whatever you can do to kind of like amp up, turn up the heat, I think is like really good, you know. For me, because I was older and I had this graphic design practice, you know, I was so busy. I I, I couldn't do like you did and like so many other people did um, and get an M a, a, a MFA. I uh I I just I didn't I didn't see how I could do that. So I I did lots of workshops and and uh conferences and 
Crick groups, you know, we were in a crick group together, a writing group together, and uh, a couple of them actually. And um, uh, another thing I did to turn up the heat early on that people might want to consider uh, is uh, I uh, signed up with a submission um, service. And um, so what they do is I identify journals for you. I did this early on because I didn't really know where to send stuff. Um, so they identify journals for you and uh, do all the legwork and the cover letters and stuff. And you have, I had to submit every two months. So that meant I had to be constantly working. I had to be constantly producing work. And um, Andromeda has got a great blog post on that at 49 Writers. She calls it um, stacking where you're kind of leapfrogging projects. You know, you work on one, you get up to a certain point. You let that go and let it kind of like you need to let projects lie fallow for a while. And then while they're laying fallow, you're not sitting around, you know, eating bonbons or whatever. You're working on another project, you know. And uh, so you just kind of leapfrog them till you get uh, uh, one of you get them up to the point you can start sending them out. Um, I, I think this strategy is a little bit more um, difficult for novelists. I mean, I mean, maybe you can. I don't know that many novelists, so maybe you can talk about this some, but um, for us, it's easy for us as short story writers to be constantly working on projects and sending them out, letting them life follow what, while they're out there being uh, adjudicated uh, and working on something else. But if you're working a, as a novelist, it can take you uh, five, ten years to get it to the point where you're ready to send that out and um uh what i would suggest to you is that you would take breaks uh from your novel and you you maybe write short stories you write essays reviews anything that's short form take chapters maybe of the novel and uh turn it into a story anything you could do to uh take a break from the novel and also uh give you something that you might submit of uh, 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 to a literary publication because, you know, that kind of constant reinforcement of getting published, you know, once or twice a year, I mean, even if only once or twice a year, I mean, that that really gives you, uh, builds your confidence and, uh, you know, makes you, uh, you know, increases your motivation to continue doing this. If I had to work on a project for 10 years and never got any you know positive feedback on it I, I don't I'm that might be kind of hard for me what do you think well you know um when you were talking about more than one project at once and um and, and just the process I read I, maybe you are you read this as well um an interview with Lauren Groff who wrote Florida mm -hmm. book of short story I read Florida she's she's got other books too and, and new one yeah. included um she she was interviewed by the New York Times and I just read it a couple of days ago. And she mm. said her, her process is she works on several novels at once. Mm. And she has the novels set up in her office in different corners of the office. Mm -hmm. So she mm -hmm. physically moves from one corner to the next. Wow. wow. When she's when she's switching the projects and she just goes back yeah. and forth. She also said that her drafting process is she'll first write a fast first draft, filling up notebooks with, with a pen or pencil. She just writes it by hand. Mm -hmm. And when she's done with that draft, she writes it all the way through, no revision. Mm -hmm. She puts that set notebook or set of notebooks away and never looks at them again. Then she sits down and writes what she remembers of that draft, feeling free huh. to add this or that. And she said that way she only remembers the really good parts. Right. <laughs> and then that's what she considers her first working draft is, is huh. when she rewrites it from memory. I'm like, oh, my that's gosh. I, oh, interesting. I know. I but never she's also doing that. that She's also doing that stacking thing that Andromeda is talking about, but working on one project, setting it aside, going to the next project. I, I don't, I just think it'd be hard if you were working on a novel and you were just working on one novel, it takes you 10 years to get it, 
maybe 10 years, eight, five, eight, 10 years to finish it. And this can take you five years, you know, of sending it out and, you know, trying to get an agent querying publications. And uh, then sometimes they're, you know, they're not accepted. And yeah. I mean, how that would be kind of, to me, kind of crushing. So this idea of working on multiple projects and multiple kinds of projects, some longer, some shorter. I mean, I've been doing um, a blog post recently and I've been, you know, writing reviews and um, I've been editing someone else's work. You know, um, I've been doing a lot of things that are writerly, you know, but uh, are not, uh, I haven't gotten back on my second book yet, but uh, I just feel like, you know, that kind of variety, you know, keeps things interesting or keeps you in, keeps me interested and, and, you know, what people call the writing life. Um, uh, Cause I mean, I, I'm a full-time writer now and, and uh, uh, so, um, so, I mean, that, that kind of variety, I think has been helpful for me. And, and like you pointed out, you know, the writing life has the really great moments and the really yeah. disappointing, sad, yeah. why am I doing this yeah. moment? Yeah. So if yeah. you can have a disappointment right before you have on another project, like, right. oh my gosh, I got this right. published or whatever. Right. It, That's why it, I think, it helps. you know, trying to publish shorter pieces while you're slogging away at, say, a big novel is going to encourage encourage you i mean there are other kinds of ways to get encouragement i mean the writing groups that you and i were in or just you know you and i talking together you know uh have been so so important to me and to keep my uh enthusiasm up because it's like super hard to do this and and not, lonely not, sometimes it's, lonely it's yeah lonely and not that many people really care you know and um, especially if you're writing short stories, and I kind of almost feel like we, us short story writers are writing for each other, you know, <laughs> which sure. I'm fine with. I really, I really am fine with that. Uh, um, although now that this book has come out, which is a strange, um, it's a kind of a strange beast because it's a novel. People feel like it's a novel. It tells one big story, but each of the chapters are short stories. So um, I, I'm doing this kind of weird thing where I, um, I've written a novel, but it's made up of short stories. Uh, um, I mean, so, I mean, I think for like any writer, you, you know, just this time issue, you know, you just, you just simply have to persist, you know, you have to be dogged. Uh, I think obsession, I mean, is kind of gotten a, you know, bad rap, that word, you know, people think obsession, you know, that's like, I don't know, bad or unhealthy or whatever. But I think you, to a certain degree, you got to be obsessed to be a writer. I mean, how could you just, I mean, I tell you what, I mean, that last chapter of my book is based on the story that I began in 2008. I mean, you know, I, I worked on that thing for, I don't know how many years that is, but that's, 15 years you know on that same story i mean it changed radically over the years but still it's kind of the same story and at least have the same shape and um if i hadn't had that ability to you know to just sort of doggedly you know not let go uh, at, you know this book would not be and uh so in a weird way, being older, knowing that uh, time doesn't stretch out, you know, in front of us forever, I think in a weird way, that's kind of helpful, you know, because we kind of realize that we have to commit, you know, really, com if we want to do this thing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um we really have to commit a hundred percent to it. And I think that's what artists have to do. Um, unfortunately, I mean, I think it's hard to dabble really, you know, you've, you've got to kind of just plunge in and do it. And if you're an older person, you, that just, you know, becomes more evident. 
uh, and more urgent, you know, you can't just go, well, I'll, I'll put that project off. I can do that later. Well, if, maybe if you, you can. want to publish, right? I mean, there are people right. who write to be in a writer's group and to yes. have fun and hobbyists, yes. you know. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. But publishing, even in a really small press, it, it takes, a, I, I agree, a lot of dedication. Yeah. I'm basically talking about, um, uh, I'm I'm basically talking to people who uh who who want to publish and uh uh um I think writing is an amazing activity and if you just write in your journal and never share it with anybody I I think that's you know completely amazing and and uh, noble uh I just as for myself if you're going to uh well, there's a couple of things. I mean, if you're going to work so hard on something, you know, I, I just, I just kind of want people to read it, you know? And, uh, but the other way, other thing I think is that um, writing is just kind of this weird way that we have of connecting with the world. And um, I mean, it is a lonely um, uh, endeavor, but it, it also, uh is expansive too it, and i feel like it also um connects you with humanity with you know with the world uh yourself, yourself you know because obviously i mean writing fiction isn't therapy but you're you know you're definitely using your stuff right you know to uh to create these stories so um yeah um yeah i think you know just what how whatever you do for writing is great but uh i'm basically talking to here uh, about st strategies to have a writing life and uh which includes publishing but not to become famous or whatever because believe me you're not become rich and famous writing well, you, you, know, it's gotta, you never know I, maybe well, maybe well, when like, the movie comes out right Oh yeah, right. Uh, I'm gonna get. So, to, Lucian, uh, you mentioned publishing. Um, you've taken the standard route of being published uh, by a tra traditional press. What do you think about self-publishing? Well, um, I mean that has become kind of huge uh, in the last ten years. Uh, I I would think. Uh, I mean, it used to be that was self-publishing kind of had a bad rap you know uh, people would these places that did self-publishing would kind of just they take advantage on people of people maybe i don't know maybe i shouldn't say that but uh um but now it seems like it it, it has earned a, a legitimacy in the in the marketplace and um um, and there are a lot of advantages to it. I could definitely see how there would be advantages uh, for an older person as well, because if it takes you five, eight, ten years to write a book, and then on top of that, it's going to take you five years to uh, to try to get somebody to publish it, and then have somebody agree to publish it, and then once they do, it can be two to three years before they actually it actually comes out. I mean, I was lucky that Biblioasis um, uh, took my book and then they brought it out about uh, 14 months later. But many, I have a, a friend of mine up here in Canada. He's been under contract to uh, one of the big publishers up here, I think for two, three years and the book still hasn't come out. So, um, it, you know, it, it can take a long time after you've completed the manuscript uh, uh, for you to secure a contract and uh, just actually see a book in your hand. So um, with a self-publishing model, you could have a book out uh, in as little as, as a year uh, or even less. If you go with the Amazon platform, I, I think it's a matter of days. Um, um, so there's some, you know, um, uh, attractiveness to that, you know, um, 
the uh, uh, the downsides, of course, are um, that you pay for everything um, uh, with the the self publishing or the hybrid publishing model, which is really just self publishing, but the hybrid publishers are supposed to vet the work. They're not supposed to just take anything. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so you're going to have to pay for the copy editing. You're going to have to pay for any uh, developmental editing that still needs to be done. The cover design, the printing, it's a lot that goes in. I was amazed at all the stuff that went into making, uh, turning my manuscript into a book. Many, many people. And it, was like you know over a year it was about a year and a half um so all that you know costs money and uh with a traditional press of uh, they they pay for not only do you not pay anything they actually pay you <laughs> so you know they're really taking a gamble on the thing and um um uh and then if you're lucky enough to um uh hook up with a press like I did uh, that has a marketing department unlike many um, you know they're going to be uh, getting the word out you know they're going to be getting you uh, press and in person so the disadvantage with self-publishing is that one you're paying for all that up front two there's no marketing department behind you Yes, the royalty payments are much higher, uh, but of course you have to remember that you've already paid out. It, you know, it can be a substantial amount of money uh, um, uh, uh, to these uh, publishers to get the book out there. So, you know, it's a real hard thing to know how to go. And um, uh, what are your thoughts on it? Well, well, I was just going to point out that with small presses, there are many different types of small presses as well um, that have different missions. So our book, Building Fires in the Snow, we published through a university press, University of Alaska right. Press, which is considered a small press, but it's a university. So their mission um, is really, you know, different than certainly like a big publisher who wants to, you know, like very, very uh, profit oriented or small presses, they might have each their unique sort of niche mission. Um, I know University of Alaska Press really wanted to be showing the North, like the full mm. breadth of the North, not just the, the the same story over and over, the mythology of Alaska. Um, their, part of their mission is really to, to um, highlight different voices in, in right. uh, Alaska. And so... Um, they also were able to move the book in a slightly different way, more through like the academic, you know, right. channels and, and going, um, yep. putting the book out there uh, to different book fairs and just on different sites that academics might be interested right. in. So, so even within the small press, you know, it's not just like, oh, that this small press, there's some that are a little bit fly by night, like they're here and they're gone. Um, Unlike uh, some, uh, you know, a press like you mentioned, Tin House, which is still publishing books, no longer the journal, but books. No, or your still press publishing in books Canada, now. you know that that's a a more established small press. It has a, a long standing reputation, right? So they're just not all the same. They're they're uh, so you kind of got you know three tiers. You got the big houses. You know, to that they're not going to take on what they call unaged, unagented manuscripts. You're going to have to have a agent to be submitted to that, and the the project's probably going to have to have you know substantial commercial appeal. And uh, then you have the small presses and the academic presses. And um, kind of the cool thing about academic presses is, as I understand it, the, those books never go out of print. And uh, where with where, so most publishers, you know, they publish an initial print run, and um, unless the book does really, really well, and most do not, um, uh, they, that's it. You know, my contract uh, says that they are obligated to print a, a, a thousand books. Uh, you know, I mean, a thousand books doesn't sound like very much, but it's at, at 
turns out it actually is a fair number of books to sell. And um, I think they actually ended up printing 2000, but um, so you got the, the big houses, you got the indie and um, uh, academic presses, and then, uh, and then, you, and this is not a hierarchy example, uh, but uh, then you have the, uh, the self-publishing and the hybrid publishers uh, um, that are this new model where the, uh, instead of the publisher funding uh, the upfront costs, the author funds the upfront costs. And, uh, and there's a lot of those and they offer different packages. You know, some will offer like, no marketing at all. They're just going to design the cover, lay it out, uh, print it. Uh, you know, then so you can get their full packages. You know, they're going to have a marketing campaigns. And, and uh, so it's a really varied uh, uh, kind of publication world out there now uh, in a way that in the past, you know, when there were just the primarily the big houses and you had to have an agent, it, it really it really shot a lot of people out. Um, so now we have this flourishing of, uh, of publishing and I've read somewhere, if you count the self-published books, 4 million books are published a year. So that, that's, you know, why you could say make a case for trying to get published traditionally with a publisher like mine who has a real strong marketing department, because it, how do you get the attention of anybody beyond your circle of family and friends, you know, if you don't have that marketing, you know, kind of power behind you. That makes sense. Um, so uh, can you let us know a little bit about your upcoming book tour in Alaska? I know you're, you're coming soon. What's I am. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited, uh, to be coming back home. I still kind of feel about a lot. Can you still see me? I moved uh -huh. over to a, okay. Uh, uh, so I'm going to be starting out in, um, uh, I, I, this is kind of a late uh, addition and I, uh, cause I was, on 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 Facebook, and somebody said, "Hey, you should reach out to Georgia Blue and do something there." And so we're going to have kind of a opening reception on at Georgia Georgia Blue Gallery. Uh, it's uh, on Arctic Boulevard on uh, Thursday, October the twelfth, from six to eight. Now, I'll do a reading, and you know there'll be books that you can buy, and um, uh, you know I'll sign books and stuff, but. I'm basically thinking of this as a social thing. I'm just so anxious to see everybody again. I've been really, I've been gone for three years since the, you know, since the pandemic. And uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to, I mean, I was a, you know, pretty for a while there, it was a pretty felt like I was a pretty big part of Alaska's literary community. And I made a lot of friends and, and I'm really looking forward to seeing people again. So you can, uh <clears throat> go to georgia's on the 12th that'd be great um um then um um two days later on the 14th i'm doing a i'm teaching a class um on um beginnings and then um it's sort of a, it's a class about how crafting uh how thinking about the beginning of of a story or a novel can actually act as a kind of a, a map to help you tap you guide your way through the narrative. So you're kind of build front loading into the beginning the themes and the images, some of the images that that you can use as a vocabulary uh, that will or a scaffolding, uh, suggesting a kind of scaffolding to take you through the the, the piece and. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to try to keep that fun and interactive, and uh, uh, we'll do some uh, we'll do some kind of overview of story structure and analyze some stuff by some great authors, Steve Al Allman, Andrew Porter, Kathy Fish, and then we'll do some writing. Um, then the, the kind of the big thing is. Uh, um, Thursday, October the 19th is uh, going to be a discussion at the writer's block with, I'm not sure who's leading that yet, but one of the 49 writers board members, maybe. 
And um, so that'll be a reading that'll be more of a, you know, we'll be talking about the, the book. Also going to be talking a little bit about the, there's a lot of social issues that are addressed in, in, in the book. Uh, <clears throat> um, family abuse, conversion therapy, queer homelessness, things like that. So I want to you know, talk a little bit, highlight some of those. And then uh, uh, and then I'll be book signing uh, out at Fireside Books on uh, October the 21st. So there'll be, there'll be some online things as well, but those are the, those are the main, main ones. Sounds like a great list. Um, yeah. Okay, well, we're almost out of time. And, um, you know, hopefully people uh, watching this, you know, if, if they want to know more, they could they could check out your, your website, but they can also come to your events and talk to you in person. Um, Definitely. I mean, I mean, um, uh, there it is, is uh, selling the book now. It's called Dreaming Home. And uh, Verit is stocking it. Verit and Tika and, and Donnell and Martha uh, are stocking it at the, the writer's block. And uh, um, uh, Georgia also will be selling the, the books at, the, at, at her event. Um, if you want to find out uh, more about the book, I've got a kind of a reader's guide in on the book that you can talk, you learn or just kind of drill down into some of these social issues. It's at www.lucianchilds.com. I'm also, um, I've also have a author's site on Facebook and you can find me on Twitter too at Lucian Childs and Instagram too. Now I finally got on the Instagram bandwagon. <laughs> Doing it all. Well, it's yeah. been so lovely catching up with you and hearing all about your exciting uh, experience with this big publication, uh, you know, get, getting uh, reviewed by the New York Times. It's just very exciting. And I can't wait to see you, uh, it, you know, in actually just a matter of days, right? <laughs> right. It's coming up here pretty soon. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for uh, tuning in and, and, and uh, being with us. I hope you all get to check out some other Alaska Book Week events. Take care. Good night. Goodbye.